So this video is chapter 27, the reproductive system. Um, this will be the anatomy of the female reproductive system. Okay, so the main organs of reproduction are the ovaries in women, the testes in men. These are known as the gonads, collectively they're the gonads. And so the, um, the ovaries are the female gonads. And there's two things that the ovaries do. They make the gametes, which is the, the haploid cells that undergo meiosis and uh, make up half of the genetic material of the new person. And they make uh, the sex hormones, in this case, estrogen and progesterone. The rest of the anatomy is all about a delivery system. It's the accessory tubes and ducts. So the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. We can divide it into the internal genitalia, which are the ovaries, uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina, and the external genitalia, uh, which are the external sex organs. So when we look at uh, a cross-section, You've probably all seen uh, pictures like this. Let's kind of go through it. So a couple of things. Um, this is the pubic symphysis right here. Um, and so that's down fairly low. Like the umbilicus is way the hell up here. So this is not up in your belly. This is down low, low, low in the pelvis. Uh, so. This is all the cavity of the abdominal pelvic cavity. And it's lined with uh, a peritoneum. It's a serous membrane. This is the parietal peritoneum here. And you'll notice that it comes down and then covers the top of the uterus here, and then along the bowels here, the rectum, and then back along the uh, the body. So this space right here is a little pocket in the peritoneum. This is called the rectouterine pouch. This is the rectum here. This is the uterus. This is the rectouterine pouch. This is important than um, well, not important anatomically. It's in it's an anatomical and nano. Um, that that um, has some important clinical properties. Oftentimes, if there's a bleed or anything going on in the abdomen, blood and things pool down here. It's also a place where endometriosis often happens. This is the vagina here. Now, the cervix protrudes into the vagina on the anterior face of it, not at the, at the end. The bit that goes up behind the, uh, is the posterior pharynx, and the bit that goes in front is the anterior pharynx. And so the penis goes right past the cervix right here. Um, You'll notice that the uterus here, which is a muscular pouch, falls forward over the top of the bladder. That's why during pregnancy, when this gets huge and full of baby, it pushes down on the bladder. This is the fallopian tube, the uterine tube here, and the ovary is right here. In the external genitalia, the clitoris is here. It also extends all the way down on either side. We'll see that in another picture. Um, the area here between uh, the labia minora, the minimus, is called the vestibule. And you will see that right here there's a little gland called uh, Bartholin's gland. 
and it produces a mucus that lubricates this area. The bladder and the is here, the urethra uh, empties into this same vesti vestibule area. So the ovaries, they're held in place by some ligaments. So they're held against the uterus by the ovarian ligament and they're suspended from the walls of the pelvic cavity by the suspensory ligament. Um, and there's a broad band of connective tissue called the mesovarian. Uh, it's, like, uh, it's like the mesentery suspends the, the intestines, the mesovarian suspends the ovary. The mesovarian is uh, just part of this thing that suspends, supports the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the top part of the vagina. And all of this is called the broad ligament. Uh, it includes the suspensory ligament and the mesovarium. So if you look at it this way, all of this is the broad ligament here. The part that suspends the um, the fallopian tubes is called the mes salpinx. Salpinx means trumpet because it's trumpet shaped. The mesovarium here suspends the ovary. The mesometrium metro is like uterus, is here. The ovarian ligament is right here, and the suspensatory ligament over here. Um, there's all, some other ligaments, we're not going to worry too much about it. This is the uterus here, and the cervix is here. The uterus has a muscular wall, and you'll notice it has three openings. There's the internal os of the cervix, the cervical canal, and the external os here. Os means mouth or opening. It's lined with an endometrium. The middle layer is a myometrium, and the outside is the perimetrium. All of those things should sound familiar. In the tube, we call this narrowing before it enters the uterus, the isthmus, which means narrowing, like the isthmus of Panama. The ampulla is here. And this is the fimbria here, like the little fingers that come very close to the ovary. The ovaries need a blood supply, and the ovarian arteries and the ovarian uh, veins are really responsible for it. The ovary is surrounded by a tunic, uh, a layer of connective tissue called the tunica albuginea. Alba, alba means white, as in albino. So the tunica albuginea means the white coat. Within the, uh, the ovary, there is a cortex on the outside that contains the follicles, and the medulla in the middle, where the, there's the blood vessels and nerves. So there's a huge collection of follicles. We'll see in the next video that uh, where they come from, but a woman is born with all the follicles that you'll ever have. You don't, uh, postnatally, you don't ever get any more. Now, the follicle is made up of a collection of cells. There is a, a haploid cell, or a cell that's stuck in meiosis, uh, and it's an immature egg cell called an oocyte. And this is surrounded and supported by uh, a layer of cells called follicle cells. And so when it's just the one layer of 
follicle cells and the oocyte stuck in meiosis, um, we call it a primordial follicle. As the follicle cells are stimulated by follicle stimulating hormone, they start to reproduce, they undergo mitosis, and they become multi-layered thick. And then those same cells are called granulosa cells. They also start producing hormones at that point. So in the primordial follicle, we have the oocyte, and the follicle cells, the follicular cells, are little squamous type cells, little flat cells. As those follicle cells get stimulated, like I say, by follicle stimulating hormone, they start to grow. And at first they become cuboidal, they might even become columnar. And they still are one cell layer um, surrounding the oocyte. As these cells start to reproduce and become more and more and they start to be producing hormones, they turn into granulosa cells and there's a couple of layers, two or more layers of it, and we then call it a secondary follicle. Now the secondary follicle will grow and grow and grow and grow until there's a space in the uh, in the granulosa cells, and these spaces coalesce and they form this big fluid-filled space called the antrum, and we call this the late secondary follicle. And eventually, this this space fills up with fluid, and the follicle gets huge. So it's a vesicle now first described by Dr. Graffian, so it's a Graffian follicle or a vesicular follicle. And it starts to protrude out of the um, surface of the ovary like a pimple. And it's fluid filled. When that vesicular follicle bursts, the oocyte leaves, but the granulosa cells stay behind. This is caused by a hormone called the luteinizing hormone, and the luteinizing hormone not only causes ovulation, but causes the granulosa cells to, to start producing progesterone. Now, the cells are have a yellowish tinge to them, so we call this the corpus luteum, which means the yellow body. And it's really the granulosa cells from the ruptured vesicular follicle at the time of ovulation. But now it's producing um, progesterone. Whereas the granulosa cells before ovulation were producing primarily estrogen. So when we look at a picture like this, it looks like the follicles are moving clockwise through the um, through the ovary. That's not what in fact what's going on and we wouldn't see all of these things in the same ovary at the same time. This is kind of an artist's conception. So we have the primordial follicles that you can't even see and they get stimulated and they, they become primary follicles. So say this primary follicle is growing. When it gets to kind of this point and we started to get multiple layers, it becomes a secondary follicle. This is still the secondary follicle. Now, it started as a primordial follicle right in this point and just is growing in place. You'll see as the secondary follicle grows and grows and grows, you start to get this fluid filled space happens. And that when we start to see that, it's a late secondary. The antrum, the space, fills up with more and more fluid. It protrudes out of the ovary like this, like a pimple, with the oocyte here and the granulosa cells here producing huge amounts of estrogen. 
luteinizing hormone is released, causes this to burst. The oocyte is ejected from the ovary and collected up by the fallopian tube. And then these cells, the granulosa cells, are affected by the hormone and start making progesterone. They turn yellow and are become the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum makes progesterone for a while. If you don't get pregnant, about 14 days into this, it stops being supported by um, luteinizing hormone and so these cells die and they leave a scar called the corpus albicans which means the white body so now in a young girl that's just started having her cycle her ovarian cycle the ovary is filled with primordial follicles she'll get a few primary follicles and they'll go and and this will happen and they will be a corpus albicans. By the time that same person is 45 or 50, there's hardly any primordial follicles left and the ovary is full of these corpus albicans because it's scar tissue and it just stays. Now, this oocyte is released into the uh, into the space, into the um, into the area, the opening of the cavity of the uh, abdomen and um, pelvis. and it gets picked up by the uterine tubes, the fallopian tubes. The fallopian tubes are sometimes called the oviducts or the uterine tubes. All names are equally acceptable. The fallopian tubes, there's one on each side, one for each ovary, flow into the uterus, and the uterus is continuous with the vagina through the cervix. So the uterine tubes have a distal expansion um, right around the ovary. It's called the ampulla. This is usually where fertilization happens. Um, there are the fimbria uh, extend around the, um, the ovary and they have cilia and the cilia are constantly moving fluid into the uterine tube. So it, it acts almost like a vacuum cleaner. The current is flowing in. Um, there's a constricted region where the tube joins the uterus and that's called the isthmus. So it's a muscular tube. So the uterine tube has peristalsis and they're ciliated cells, epithelial cells, that create a current. And so the oocyte is moved from the ampulla towards the isthmus by peristalsis and by the cilia. Now, in this um, epithelium, there are non-ciliated cells, and their job is to secrete nutrients that keep the oocyte alive and provide energy and keep the sperm cells alive that have made it that far. And like I said, it's supported by the mesocelpinks, mesocelpinks. Same picture. So the uterine tube is here, the fimbria, the infundibulum and ampulla, and isthmus here. Now the uterus has a couple of parts to it. 
There's the body of the uterus, which is the main part. There's the part above the isthmus on either, in either corner. It's called the fundus. And there's an isthmus leading to the cervix. So that's called the, well, that's called the isthmus. The cervix is the opening that projects into the vagina. So there is an external os in the cervix going into the vagina. There's an internal os going into the uterus. And there are a lot of mucus cells um, along this, in this entire cervical canal. And the whole area and it produces a lot of mucus that blocks uh, everything from going, getting into the uterus including sperm except in mid-cycle. In mid-cycle the hormones at about the time of ovulation the hormones make this um, this mucus become very watery and easier for the sperm to get through. The broad ligament, uh, or the mesometrium, supports the uterus. Uh, there's cardinal ligaments, right? uterosacral ligaments, secured to the sacrum, they hold it in place. <coughs> A lot of times, women that have had many pregnancies, these ligaments go lax, and the uterus can uh, flop around a little bit, it can fall backwards, um, yeah, it can lead to various um, pathologies, what we call them. So, this is the fundus up here, this is the body, this is the isthmus, this is the cervix with the internal loss, the cervical canal, and the external loss. I've already mentioned the peritoneal pouch. So the vesica uterine pouch is between the bladder and the uterus, and the recto uterine pouch is between the rectum and the uterus. Okay, so in the wall, there is a parametrium, which is the visceral layer of the peritoneum. There's the myometrium, which is a smooth muscle wall that's very thick, and the endometrium, which is the mucosal lining, and it's a specialized epithelium. Um, now, this endometrium is divided into two parts, the stratum functionalis, functional layer, that changes with the cycles of the hormones. It's the part that comes off with, it, with every menstruation. It, um, it's replaced then at the beginning of the next cycle. Deep to that basal layer is called the stratum basalis. And it is the anchor. This is what, where the new stratum functionalis comes from. Uh, it doesn't respond to hormones, so it's there all the time. Now, the uterus has a very major blood supply. So, off the internal iliac arteries become the uterine arteries, um, and then they go out into the myometrium, and they arch around, so they're called the arcuit, and then they, there's branches that go into the endometrium, that radiate into the men, in, endometrium, which is called the radial branches. Um, these are spiral in the functionality and straight in the stratum basalis. Um, the spiral arteries have more surface area, and so when they vasoconstrict, it cuts off the blood supply. The stratum functionalis will die and then fall off. So it kind of looks like this. Off the arcuate comes the straight, or the radial artery, and then the straight artery, 
and this is becomes the um, spiral artery. Blood flows this way up into here into this, into the endometrium, and it leaves via these venules and veins that end up coming into the arcuate vein. So, um, you'll notice on the veins, there are all these sinuses, and they fill up with blood. And so the blood pressure is very low here. When this goes into vasospasm, oxygen and nutrients don't get to this part of the endometrium. It starts to crack, it die, and fall off. And as it does so, the blood trapped in these sinuses is released, and that's where, where the menstrual flow comes from. Now, there are also uterine glands, and they, they start down here in really um, the myometrium, and they go through the stratum basale and all the way up to the surface through the stratum functionalis. So this part of the gland is lost with each menstrual cycle as well. But this part stays put. The vagina is the, the organ of copulation and it's also the birth canal. It's between the bladder and the rectum. Uh, from up near the cervix, right to the exterior. The anterior wall of it is the urethra is embedded in it. It is um, got like all the tubes in the body. It's got a bunch of layers. There's a, an adventitia. This is a connective tissue because it's not into the cavity. It's embedded in other tissues, it's, uh, it has an adventitia, which is a fibroelastic connective tissue. It's a loose connective tissue. The walls of the vagina itself uh, have smooth muscle, and it's called the muscularis. And then the lining, the epithelial lining, the mucosa of it, as it were, is a stratified squamous epithelium with ridges in it, called rugae. Um, the forex uh, are on either side of the cervix, as I pointed out in the previous diagram. External genitalia look like this. Um, this is the mons pubis. It's where the pubic hair is. Um, it is fat. It's for cushioning, really. This here is the labia majora. It is homologous to the scrotum. It's the exact same tissue as the scrotum. In the male, the testes descend down past the uh, inguinal ligament and reside in this space here. In women, it just stays filled with fat and again, provides some cushioning. This is a normal skin on here uh, with hair follicles, etc. This here on either side is the labia uh, minora. It is a hairless, um, skin, flaps of skin, uh, that are analogous to the shaft of the penis. You can almost picture that if this was joined to here, that it would form a tube uh, with the glands of the clitoris at the top, which would be, therefore, analogous to a penis. Um, the clitoris here, the glands of the clitoris is all that you can see. Um, uh, the prepus is like the foreskin, and it hangs down and covers the, the clitoris here. 
this is the vestibule of the vagina. The urethral orifice is here. The vaginal orifice is here. There are two little ducts uh, from the greater vestibular gland, Bartholin's gland, and their job is to make um, mucus to lubricate this area. The stratified squamous epithelium that lines the vagina can't have goblet cells. There's no mucus. So the mucus for lubrication comes from these glands here and from the cervix itself. So that's just what I just was talking about and the greater vestibulus gland. Now, men have the same gland called the bulbo-urethral gland. Um, it's found at the base of the penis, and the mucus it produces goes into the urethra, cleans out the urethra with erection, and then is secreted out uh, of the orifice and then lubricates the glands of the penis uh, in preparation for it. Coitus. The clitoris is almost exactly the same as a penis. Um, it is um, erectile tissue with a lot of nerve endings in it. There's about the same number of nerve endings in a clitoris as there are in a penis. Um, but a clitoris is much smaller, so the nerve endings are much more densely packed. So it's a very sensitive organ. Now, what most people don't understand is that if you take away all of this tissue, that the clitoris actually is kind of like a wishbone. These are called the crus, or the crutches, the legs of the of the clitoris, and you'll see that it goes on either side of the vaginal opening. Um, and um, the clitoris comes up and then bends down here. So when pressure is applied this way in the vagina, it pushes back here, which then pushes the clitoris down onto the shaft of the penis um, for stimulation. Um, it becomes engorged with sexual excitement. Um, there's a corpus cavernosa, the same as a penis. It fills with blood. There is really an erection. Um, and yeah, it, it works pretty much the same way. Now, the mammary glands um, really should be in the integumentary system, but whatever, they are uh, they're included here. So they're really modified sweat glands. Um, sweat and milk are not very much different. There's just a little more fat and protein in milk than in sweat. Um, they uh, are suspended by ligaments that attach the, the breast to the underlying muscle, the platysma muscle uh, specifically, the superficial fascia of the pectoral muscles. They are mostly fat. Uh, there are some, uh, some glandular alveoli that produce the milk. So the milk is produced, it passes through lactiferous tracts, into the sinuses and then opens out to the nipples. It looks like this, so it's suspended by the suspensory ligament on this superficial fascia. It's divided into these lobes. Each lobe has these glands that pass up into the sinus where the milk collects and then out the nipple during lactation. Lots of fat here. Um, 
most mammals' breasts are only really visible during lactation. In humans, for a bunch of biological reasons, we we have what are what's called um, occult. Um, oh, I've just lost it. Um, it we don't go into heat. Uh, it's uh, so normally breasts signify that um, a female mammal is receptive. We show that all the time. Um, and so there's a lot of fat in the breast. The size of the breast is not indicative of how much milk can be produced. Um, Large breasts probably just have more fat. That's about it. You can look at things about breast cancer, um, detection and treatment, but it's not part of this course. Okay, so in, I'll end this video here, and in the next video we'll look at the physiology.